a man and his girlfriend have been implicated in the 2005 murder of his wife following the recent revelation of her remains at a racetrack in West Texas. The remains of Naomi Miller were uncovered in the 3600 block of FM2105 in San Angelo, as reported by the Tom Green County Sheriff's Office. Initially, authorities had initiated a missing persons investigation regarding Miller's disappearance, which subsequently evolved into a homicide inquiry. She was last seen in December 2005. On March 2nd, her husband, 45-year-old Robert Miller, was taken into custody for her murder, while his girlfriend, 41-year-old LaDonna Yoder, was arrested shortly thereafter, according to KTXS. Naomi Miller was not officially reported missing until 2015 when a tipster revealed that she had not been seen for a decade and suggested that she may have fallen victim to foul play at the hands of her husband. In the days following, investigators spoke with Robert Miller's family, who recounted that he had made alarming remarks about killing Naomi and concealing her body beneath their home. Cadaver dogs detected signs of decomposition within the residence, and authorities noted an unusual alteration to the kitchen floor, which appeared to provide access to a shallow grave, although no remains were found at that time. Yoder recently disclosed to investigators that she witnessed a confrontation between the Millers in December 2005, during which she saw Robert emerge from the bedroom with what she believed to be his wife's body wrapped in a sheet. While Robert acknowledged the altercation, he insisted that Naomi had left with an unidentified boyfriend. Yoder further detailed the disposal of Naomi Miller's body in a shallow grave within the home that night, claiming it was later exhumed and reburied at the former San Angelo Speedway, where the remains were ultimately discovered. Robert Miller had established the racetrack in 2006, aiming to revive racing at the San Angelo Speedway during the mid-2000s. The local publication celebrates the revival of auto racing in the city, as detailed in a 2008 piece by Paul Harris. In this article, the reporter shifts focus from Robert's wife, Naomi, to a new couple, Robert and LaDonna Miller. The tragic murder occurred on December 2nd, 2005. Court documents reveal that Yoder confessed to investigators about her and Miller's conspiracy to commit the crime. She described a prearranged signal, indicating that upon its observation, she was to suffocate the victim. Although Yoder initially placed a pillow over Michelle Miller's face, she ultimately removed it, leaving it within Robert Miller's reach. He then proceeded to suffocate his wife, while Yoder admitted to doing nothing to intervene. The couple buried the victim's body beneath a residence on Glass Road in 2006, later exhuming it to re-enter at the old racetrack off FM2105. In March 2017, the Tom Green County Sheriff's Office had been diligently investigating this case for over a year following a tip-off. On March 2nd, Robert Miller was apprehended. Six days later, on March 8th, the remains of Michelle Miller were discovered, leading to LaDonna Yoder's arrest on March 14th. It's a significant relief, even knowing that we acted correctly. The district attorney's office was prompt, allowing us to achieve swift closure. I have spoken with both the mother and father, who grasped the implications of the plea bargains. They are immensely thankful for the support received and hope this will provide closure for their family, enabling them to finally lay Naomi Michelle Miller to rest in peace, stated Sergeant. William Fivish, an investigator with the Tom Green County Sheriff's Office. Yoder and Miller will remain in the Tom Green County Jail until their transfer to a state facility. A sexual predator responsible for a heinous triple murder that eluded justice for 28 years has been sentenced to life imprisonment. Tony Dice, who believed he had evaded detection after the brutal slaying of 27-year-old Norma Richards and her two young daughters in their Dalston home in July 1982, was ultimately apprehended due to the diligent efforts of journalist Peter Law. 
Law was conducting research for a biography on footballer Laurie Cunningham, whose brother was in a relationship with Richards. His inquiries prompted a cold case review, leading authorities to revisit preserved forensic evidence and reopen the investigation. Dice was arrested in October of the previous year. At the time of the tragic events, Keith Cunningham was living with Richards and her three daughters from a prior relationship. The youngest, four-year-old Rodine, miraculously survived as she was staying with her grandmother that weekend. During the trial, it was revealed that Dice, a resident of Forest Gate in East London, had a history as a sexual predator who frequently carried a knife. Several women testified that he had attempted to assault them at knife point. Initially, he had escaped suspicion due to his minor acquaintance with Cunningham and Richards. On that fateful morning, he had followed Richards home from a club, knowing her partner was away in Spain. Dice assaulted and fatally stabbed her, and it is believed that one or both of the young girls, Samantha, nine, and Soretta, seven, were awakened by the commotion. To silence them, they were drowned and stabbed, ensuring they could not identify their mother's assailant. It was only through advancements in DNA technology that Dice was ultimately brought to justice. Prosecutor Aftab Jafferji QC stated that Richards had been raped and stabbed five times while the girls were discovered in a bathtub filled with water. Samantha had suffered eight stab wounds and Soretta had been drowned. Their only crime was witnessing their mother's attacker and thus their innocent lives were brutally extinguished, Jafferji remarked. Dice endeavored to obscure his involvement by painting the National Front NF emblem on various walls and doors. This ruse was destined to fail, and even the initial investigations in 1982 were not deceived, the prosecutor remarked. Law enforcement had conducted arrests and interrogated potential witnesses, yet no additional individuals faced charges for the heinous murders. As he sentenced Dice at the Old Bailey, Judge Anthony Morris imposed three life sentences, declaring it would amount to a whole life term. These crimes were marked by unspeakable brutality and profound severity, he stated. You evaded justice for 28 years, and since your apprehension last year, you have exhibited no remorse whatsoever. I am convinced that the gravity of these offenses is extraordinarily high, and you should never be released. Laurie Cunningham, who rose to prominence with West Bromwich Albion, tragically lost his life in a car accident in Spain at the age of 33 in 1989. He was the first black player to represent the England national team. Rodine Cunningham, now 32, remains haunted by the memories of what she and her grandmother uncovered upon returning to their family residence. At the age of four, I discovered my mother and sisters lifeless in our flat, she recounted in a victim impact statement addressed to the judge. I was terrified. My mother lay there, covered in blood. I rushed upstairs only to find my sister in the bath, also deceased. Following the funeral, I moved in with my paternal grandparents. My upbringing was good. I thrived in school and had many friends, yet the shadow of my mother's and sister's deaths lingered in my mind. It felt strange transitioning from the youngest to the eldest, unable to share conversations about boys' makeup and secrets with my sisters. I remember taking their belongings and running off with them, enjoying laughter and fun together. What might it have been like to grow up alongside them? That remains a mystery I will never solve. As I matured, the reality became more difficult to bear. I understood they would not return. Each year on my birthday, I would weep tears of joy as I reminisced about them, intertwined with profound sorrow. Regarding my other family members, there was a palpable silence surrounding discussions with my mother. It seemed the weight of it all was simply too overwhelming for them to bear. In October 1992, in the serene town of Croydon, 
an elderly woman of 89 years found herself in a deep slumber within the confines of her solitary home. Her tranquility was abruptly shattered by the intrusion of a man clad entirely in black, his face obscured by a balaclava as he directed a blinding light into her eyes. In a harrowing act, he assaulted her twice and ransacked her residence. This tragic event marked the beginning of a relentless 17-year investigation, heralding the onset of the Night Stalker's reign of terror. Fast forward to September 1998 in Warlingham, Surrey, where an 81-year-old woman endured a terrifying attempted assault alongside an indecent attack and burglary. In response, Operation Minstead was initiated in 1998 to delve into these heinous crimes. Investigators uncovered DNA evidence from the 1998 incident that intriguingly matched samples from the 1992 case, specifically semen. The absence of a condom during the assault corroborated witness accounts identifying a male assailant. Despite the collection of 2,000 samples, none yielded a match and the DNA National Database revealed no prior offenders linked to these crimes, thus expanding the search parameters significantly. By June 1999, a 71-year-old woman fell victim to burglary in Beckenham, Kent. The following month, in July 1999, a 77-year-old woman faced an attempted burglary in Orpington, Kent. That same month witnessed a spate of further offenses. An 83-year-old man was indecently assaulted and robbed in Colston, Surrey, an 82-year-old woman suffered a similar fate in Croydon, Surrey, and another 82-year-old woman was assaulted and burglarized in Croydon as well. The grim narrative continued into August 1999, with two more cases involving 88-year-old women, one indecently assaulted and robbed in an undisclosed location, and the other subjected to a brutal assault in Orpington, Kent. The latter victim recounted her ordeal, stating, he covered my face and mouth, and I felt as though I was being smothered. I could neither breathe nor see. He whispered, Don't scream, I won't hurt you. His brutality was overwhelming. All I wanted was for him to stop. The pain was excruciating. She endured the debilitating effects of osteoarthritis, accompanied by lacerations to her lips and severe injuries to her waist and hips that necessitated extensive surgical intervention. In addition, she faced a life-threatening incident involving a perforated bowel. In 2001, Detective Superintendent Simon Morgan assumed command of Operation Minstead, which was already linked to 73 cases associated with the notorious Night Stalker. Morgan discerned several critical elements from the prior case files. The flattened grass outside the residences suggested that the assailant was willing to wait for hours, ensuring that their victim had retired for the night. The intruder would enter with utmost caution, occasionally removing an entire window to gain access, while meticulously clearing away any objects that might create noise. He would sever phone lines or conceal mobile devices to restrict the victim's means of communication, and he unscrewed all the light bulbs to prevent them from illuminating the space and spotting him. Panic alarms were also disabled as part of his methodical approach. His modus operandi involved shining a bright flashlight into the victim's faces while demanding adult activity. Observations of his movements and the manner in which he handled his victims suggested a background in caring for the elderly. True to his moniker, he operated exclusively under the cover of darkness. What intrigued many investigators was the pristine condition of the crime scenes meticulously tidied by the perpetrator, hinting at a possible obsessive-compulsive disorder, who else would clean up after committing such heinous acts? Although he had left behind DNA evidence, his primary concern seemed to be the tidiness of the scene. Advanced DNA analysis did reveal an ethnic origin of Afro-Caribbean, yet this led to a staggering pool of 21,000 potential suspects, complicating the investigation further. By October 2002, Three years later, a 77-year-old woman fell victim to indecent assault and burglary in Croydon, Surrey, followed by another incident in March 2003, where a 78-year-old woman was burglarized in West Dulwich, London. In September 2004, an 84-year-old woman fell victim to a burglary in Bromley, Kent. Twelve years into the investigation, the police found themselves at a standstill, lacking leads, DNA matches, and witnesses beyond the victims themselves.
Armed with the knowledge that the assailant was of Afro-Caribbean descent, officers took the unusual step of personally delivering requests for DNA samples to local black men, aiming to eliminate potential suspects. They assured the community that any samples not matching would be destroyed. While many were willing to cooperate, eager to aid in the capture of the elusive Night Stalker, the initiative sparked controversy, with 125 individuals initially refusing, citing discrimination. However, they were persuaded to comply after police indicated that their refusal could be perceived as suspicious behavior. Although five individuals were arrested, they were subsequently released. This effort allowed the police to narrow their suspect list from 21,000 to 1,000, but they could only collect DNA from those on the list if they committed further offenses. In 2009, after a six-year hiatus, the Night Stalker re-emerged. In May, a 62-year-old man was burglarized in Bromley, followed by an 82-year-old in South Croydon in June. August saw an 88-year-old man indecently assaulted and robbed in Thornton Heath, Surrey. The assailant struck twice in October, targeting an 87-year-old woman in Forest Hill, London, and an 82-year-old woman in Croydon. November brought an attempted burglary at the home of an 86-year-old woman in Croydon. However, on November 15, 2009, the Night Stalker's reign of terror came to an end. Detective Chief Inspector Colin Sutton had established a dedicated burglary squad in Croydon, the area frequented by the perpetrator, requesting 150 officers, but receiving only 70. On the first night of surveillance, the Night Stalker committed three burglaries, just outside the watchful eyes of the squad. Yet, a stroke of luck emerged when CCTV captured footage of a man entering a vehicle later identified as a silver Vauxhall Zafira. Seventeen days later, a squad member spotted a similar car. An hour later, a man is observed hastily approaching the same vehicle, prompting the police to take action. At approximately 2 a.m., after a lengthy 17-year pursuit, the notorious Night Stalker is apprehended. Delroy Easton Grant, born in 1957 in Jamaica, faced abandonment at the tender age of two when his mother departed, leaving him in the care of his grandparents. His father relocated to the UK, and at the age of 15, Grant followed suit, marking the beginning of his criminal endeavors. Initially recognized for minor thefts, he soon escalated to burglary, culminating in a two-year prison sentence for armed robbery. In 1975, he encountered his first wife, Janet, and they became engaged within a mere fortnight. However, their marriage quickly soured as Grant's compulsive need for order and control led to violent outbursts whenever things were amiss. They welcomed two children, but after five tumultuous years, Janet chose to leave. Relocating to Leicestershire, he found a new partner and had two more children. Yet in 1991, he was incarcerated for handling stolen goods, leading to the dissolution of that relationship as well. Grant returned to Southeast London, where he married his second wife, Jennifer, a devoted Jehovah's Witness with two daughters from a prior union. They settled in Brockley, southeast London, raising their two sons alongside her daughters. As Jennifer developed multiple sclerosis, Grant took on the role of her primary caregiver, having previously worked as a care home assistant. By day, he tended to her needs, while by night, he drove a taxi. The community regarded him as a kind-hearted, compassionate individual, known for his warm smile and regular church attendance. On March 3, 2011, Grant stood before Woolwich Crown Court, facing 29 charges, including sexual assault, indecent assault, and burglary, spanning from 1991 to 2009. It is estimated that he may have perpetrated up to 600 attacks on victims aged 68 to 93, including 10 men. Remarkably, Grant pleaded not guilty, despite his DNA being found at numerous crime scenes. In a desperate bid to extricate himself from the clutches of justice, he attempted to leverage his misguided understanding of DNA and forensic science, arguing that the authorities had misidentified the perpetrator. Instead, he insinuated that they should turn their attention to his eldest son from his marriage to Janet, hoping to find enough genetic similarity to shift the blame onto him. The jury was presented with irrefutable evidence. Grant's DNA was a perfect match. When his former wife, Janet, took the stand, he made the astonishing claim 
that she had illicitly preserved samples of his semen and saliva back in 1977, enlisting a physician friend to store them in a hospital as part of a nefarious plot to frame him. It is worth noting that the methods for retrieving such biological materials were not even developed during the 1970s. In a moment of absurd bravado, Grant remarked, I don't know why you're bothering, I always wear gloves, as his fingerprints were being collected. The jury learned that a crowbar and a change of clothing had been discovered in Grant's vehicle. On March 24, 2011, he was convicted on all 29 counts. Judge Peter Rook sentenced him to an astonishing 27 years in prison, along with four life sentences, declaring, I have no doubt that you are a very evil man capable of committing heinous crimes. The victims of his atrocities were left in a state of profound trauma. Cynthia Stevens, age 93, lost her will to live following an assault in South London in 2009, passing away three months later after refusing to eat. Others chose to minimize their experiences, with one victim expressing reluctance to involve the police, fully aware of their overwhelming caseload. This is what rendered Grant particularly despicable. He preyed upon a uniquely vulnerable demographic. Many of his victims suffered from dementia or Alzheimer's, and others came from a wartime background that instilled a deep-seated reluctance to contact authorities unless absolutely necessary. They felt they would be imposing a burden on the police and were hesitant to seek medical attention unless their situation was dire. In a chilling juxtaposition, Grant exhibited moments of perverse tenderness amidst his cruelty, kissing some victims on the cheek and bidding them goodnight after the assault. On one occasion, he even offered an apology to a victim after taking her pulse, saying, I'm really sorry, I won't do this again. At times, he found himself compelled to retreat without enacting violence, particularly when his chosen victim confronted him with a piercing rebuke. One such instance led him to utter an apology after being confronted with the question, what would your mother think of you? Nevertheless, Delroy Grant remains a ruthless serial perpetrator, one who orchestrates his heinous acts with meticulous precision, even willing to sacrifice his own son to evade the consequences of his actions. He is slated for parole eligibility in 2038. In 1972, Naperville, a Chicago suburb with a population of approximately 22,000, was home to the Hansen family. Jerome and Marguerite Hansen, parents of three, resided in this quiet neighborhood with their children, 18 years old Jill, 15 years old Julie, and 12 years old Mark. On the evening of July 7th, 1972, Jerome and Marguerite left for the night, leaving the children at home. At around 7 p.m., Julie borrowed her brother's bike and departed, but failed to return home that night. Her siblings, Jill and Mark, initially assumed she was staying with a friend, but by the afternoon of July 8th, they grew concerned when Julie didn't come home or contact them. Upon realizing that none of Julie's friends or family had seen her since the previous day, Jill reported Julie missing that afternoon. The police launched a search of the neighborhood and discovered Julie's bike in a ditch approximately two miles from the Hansen residence. Tragically, about 100 yards from the bike, in a nearby cornfield, they found the lifeless body of 15-year-old Julie Hansen. An examination of the scene revealed that Julie was fully clothed and had suffered multiple stab wounds, totaling 36, to her back, neck, and chest. Additionally, evidence indicated that she had been sexually assaulted. Despite initial efforts, the police were unable to identify any suspects in the weeks and months following the murder, and the case eventually went cold. In 2019, authorities sought to re-examine the DNA evidence from the crime scene, but unfortunately, it had deteriorated significantly and was compromised by bacterial contamination. To overcome this obstacle, they enlisted the services of a specialized company to create a usable DNA profile. Fortunately, the specialized company successfully generated a DNA profile, which was then entered into the FBI's Combined DNA Index System. 
Although no immediate match was found, the police pursued a new lead in 2020 using genetic genealogy. This approach led them to revisit the January 1976 murder of 16-year-old Pamela Mora, which had been solved. Pamela was abducted, raped, and strangled while walking to a fast food restaurant in Woodridge, Illinois, just six miles from Naperville. The perpetrator, Bruce Lindahl, was identified as the killer. Notably, Lindahl had also committed another violent crime in Naperville, fatally stabbing 18-year-old Charles Huber 28 times in April 1981. During this attack, Lindell accidentally severed his own femoral artery, resulting in his death from blood loss in Huber's apartment. Following the identification of Bruce Lindell as Pamela Maurer's killer, authorities considered him a potential suspect in Julie Hansen's murder due to his age and proximity to the crime scene at the time. However, a DNA comparison ruled out Lindell as a match. Undeterred, the police employed genetic genealogy, the same technique that solved Pamela's case, to pursue new leads. This approach ultimately led to the arrest of 76-year-old Barry Lee Welpley on June 2, 2021, nearly 49 years after Julie's murder. Welpley, who was 27 at the time of the crime, resided less than a mile from the Hansen family. Details about Welpley's life are scarce. He worked as a welder before retiring and had lived in his current neighborhood in Moundsview, Minnesota for 17 years, maintaining a low profile with infrequent interactions with his neighbors. Barry Lee Welpley's personal life remains somewhat of a mystery. Some neighbors speculated that he may have lived with a woman at one point as they occasionally saw a woman tending to his garden, but her identity and whereabouts are unknown. Welpley was described as reclusive, with one neighbor recalling only a single conversation with him in 17 years, and another family stating they hadn't seen him at all during their five-year residency on the same street. Authorities have not publicly disclosed whether Welpley has a prior criminal record. He was being held in jail with a $10 million bond, awaiting a court date that has yet to be scheduled. However, two years after his arrest, Barry Lee Welpley was found unresponsive early Friday on February 9, 2024, in his cell at the Will County Jail in Joliet. He was transported to a Joliet hospital, where he was pronounced dead. The police are actively investigating whether Welpley may have been responsible for additional murders beyond the alleged killing of Julie Hansen.